In this video is going to be one of two videos in a series where we're going to talk about the 13 factors you need to be aware of when trying to choose the right foundation underneath your shipping container house. In this video, we're going to talk about six of them and then be sure to check out the next video for the other seven. Let's start with number one, probably the most important factor and that is the soil capacity. That means the structural capacity of the soil. You don't want a soil that is going to just squish when you put your house upon it, right? And so you're going to need really to have it tested. You really ought to test to see what is in that soil. Is it clay? Is it sand? Is it organic type of mulchy stuff that's squishy? As a matter of fact, I have right now a project where we've already selected the foundation, but we found that it is kind of squishy in some areas. We've already designed, our structural engineer that is, designed the foundation to be a stem wall all the way around made of concrete. Later, the contractor said, hey, let's use a stem wall made of CMU on top of a spread footing that still reinforced concrete. And and we'll do that too. Either way is good. The structural engineer was able to approve that as well. So when the contractor went out to the site and he started excavating for the stem wall foundation, he found that there's actually some squishy areas, not all, but there are some patches that have squishy areas in it. And what probably happened is since this is a, an addition to the, an existing building, they must have taken some of the organic soil in the area that they were building the original building and they just dumped it in the front yard and just let the grass grow over it. None to be the wiser, you really can't see it because it's all kind of covered up with all kinds of landscaping. But you can't really build on it. And so we then had to have a geotech engineer to go out there and do different test drills all around in different spots. And when that drilling is done, it's drilling down the cylinders that captures the strata of the soil. So you'll get to a good idea about what kind of soil is at each one of the levels. And he found indeed that it had some organic material at the upper level in some of the patched areas. In the way they test also, they send it to a lab and they, one way is called a sieve test. And it's like the old uh, 49ers, a little gold, gold rush where they have the sifting, they're sifting the soil and to see what goes through that screen and each time they sift it with a finer and finer sift and then they categorize the percentage of the soil that went through the different sizes of the screens or the sifts. And that then will help them understand what the soil capacity is, the structural capacity of the soil is, per level of that, of that caisson of that testing. Now that they determined that there is a squishy material indeed and it's not going to be structural capable of holding the building up in those areas, what do you do with the soil? Well, what he's going to have to do, the contractor is, he's going to have to dig up all that organic area all the way down to better soil and he has one of two options. He's got to get that out and he's got to replace it with either good soil that is structural uh, has a good structural capacity or put gravel in with various aggregate sizes and then that works well because all these little pieces of rocks goes kind of in the voids of the bigger pieces and so it mixes together. The soil that is, if he went the first way and he just brought then this, this let's say clay or whatever that's not, that has some kind of a sand and other, other things in there that's structural capacity. Uh, capable of holding the foundation. Once he puts it in there, he's going to tamper it down. And then he has to compact that up to, they say, a 90% compaction. 100% would be like rock solid. And 90% is about as good as a human can do, even with the machines that we have today out in the field. And that is what is really usually used. To, uh, talk to your structural engineer, but that's usually the percentage needed to be able to build a building upon. That Every one of those steps of digging and hauling and hauling back and compacting, each one of those steps is costly. So the contractor wanted to be able to save some of that money. And he's willing to pay a little bit more for the 
gravel instead of getting the sand, I mean, getting the, uh, the dirt that has to be compacted because gravel doesn't necessarily have to be compacted so much. It finds its own spaces, fills its own voids, and then it'll be structurally capable of holding the load that the structural engineer has designed it to hold. And the only thing is the gravel is more expensive than the dirt. But when it's all said and done, the net cost is less with the gravel because he doesn't have to go through that, set, that extra step to compact it and that's the direction he's going to go. Another way I didn't mention is kind of like a hybrid. They could have taken out some of the organic material, put it on the site and brought the better soil in and just kind of mixed together at a certain percentage and put it all back in and then compact it. And we're not doing that because the site is too small in order to stage that piling. So I'm just telling you this because you need to be aware that yes, the structural capacity of soil is very important. In fact, that's number one on our list of 13, but there's other factors that can come along that will affect you as well. That will affect the structural capacity of the soil. And that is my example that we're going through right now with the squishy soil. You may also find that there's underground foundations and <laughs> that also happened in the same project. We've got these concrete foundations that were hidden underneath the dirt and we didn't even know about it because the landscaping is over it and it was in the front yard of this building. Now that we're adding on to this building, we need to be able to put footings where this old foundation is. So back to a structural engineer we go and he's designing a new foundation stem wall that will just sister all along these other uh, foundation walls in some areas. In some areas we have to just take it out, it's just in the way. So there's additional costs. Another thing you might want to consider in the structural capacity is what else is in that soil? You might even have a fuel tank that's abandoned in there. And if there's a fuel tank, tank you might have to get what they call a tank anchor to get it out of the site and then you might have the environmental uh, folks that the agencies want to make sure that it doesn't have any fuel that's leached out in the, in the yard and underneath the soil, uh, making sure that it's not toxic. And so there's additional hidden costs that you need to be aware of. I'm just warning you about that. So that's a lot, it's a lot to say about the structural capacity, and that's number one. Number two is the climate. The climate will also affect what type of foundation you select. It's that it could be a relative humidity that could be affecting the temperature of the climate. If it's a really humid area and moist area or really semi-arid dry, like in West Texas, you, it all affects your decision, your structural engineer's decision about what kind of foundation to put in underneath your shipping container. The, the humidity, for example, and the temperature will greatly affect how the structure, the con concrete is going to be designed, the mix design for the stem wall or whatever type of foundation you're going to use, piles or whatever. And that uh, if it's really cold, then it's not going to cure properly oftentimes because the water that's mixed into the concrete can freeze. And what your structural engineer might do if it's getting, if it's the concrete is being poured during a different time of the year, a cold climate and cold season, then they may actually add some admixture into the mixture of the concrete to control how fast it sets. And when you're talking about concrete setting, you're talking about how it's curing, how it's uh, getting hard, you know, when it's getting dried up and hard, uh, but it, in layman's terms, but it's actually the curing of the concrete and it sets into its design strength after 7, 21 days. Now the third factor you're need, going to need to consider is the frost line. The frost line is the line in the soil deep down from the top soil down. How far is the frost line? And that frost line is defined as where the soil stops freezing on really cold days. And you, it's important to have your foundation set upon firm foundation below the frost line, except for if you're using piles or uh, caissons. Uh, those go down really deep and they rely on the friction of those piles or caissons. But on the frost line being, you need to have your foundation below the frost line because like everything else, when things are cold, they contract. And when they get warm, they expand. 
and uh, Clay is a big culprit uh, of this, is that clay will expand and contract quite a bit. And you need to be aware of what type of soil, like I just said on number one, and also where the frost line is. And, and when you're putting your bearing below the frost line, then you're controlling what that bearing point is so it's not contracting and expanding and if it does contract and expand it could crack up your foundation and that's something you're trying to avoid obviously by the way give me a thumbs up if you like this kind of information and be sure to leave comments down below with any questions you have the fourth factor in this video i want to talk about is ease of construction now if you're a do-it-yourselfer you might have limited skills and maybe you're only good at let's say carpentry and then they'll but then that's really good then that you can build the forms for the pour in place concrete whatever your trades are that are available not just you but even the contractors or some countries are specifically a certain type of construction as opposed to the others let's say for example um, in some areas they do use a lot of concrete and they do not use very much steel because they don't really know how to use steel too much because they don't have that material to work with too often so their skill level is phenomenal on one type of construction so whatever the ease of construction is in your area of the world might be a big deciding factor about what kind of foundation to design for your shipping container so number five of the factors is the permanence of building some municipalities require the foundation to be permanent. They don't want the house to move at all. And then some of the people, uh, some of the contractors I've, I know of, will use these turnbuckles that already come with the shipping container, you know, the type that they use on the ships to lock them together uh, between shipping containers and stack them high. They'll use those right at the footing. And if you want to know kind of how that works, check out the video that I have made about foundations and you'll see how that, that actually turnbuckle actually works onto the uh, foundation plate. But some municipalities won't allow for that turnbuckle to be used because they don't want it to be a temporary structure. They want to be able to have a permanent taxable property and if you move your house off that property, it's, they can view it as an unapproved property, so they're not going to make as much tax money off of it. So check with your municipality to see whether or not they'll allow for the uh, shipping container to be built upon a movable foundation. Now, if they do allow you to have a non-permanent building on your site, you might actually just want to put it on blocks or put it on... Uh, railroad ties or things of that sort, maybe a, a bed of gravel. Um, check with your structural engineer to make sure that it's still a stable type of foundation to be placed upon, but those are the types of foundations that would not actually be in the earth, but they would be just on the surface that you could place your shipping container on top of, kind of like what this one's doing, right onto an asphalt. and. That way you can take it away when you want it to be uh, in another location. The sixth consideration is the groundwater level. It's really important for you to know whether or not there's some underground streams or any kind of water that is under the ground that's permanently there or if the, if the foundation itself like sand will absorb the, sand, the water and it could actually heave up your house. I had a project one time where uh, the, it was an existing building, the foundation was already built. It was actually in the Bronx in New York, an old school and they always had water coming into the basement and then later on they found old maps and, and before anything was built back when it was just barely a settlement manhattan a settlement yeah back when it was just that and there were all kinds of underground streams and above ground streams in that area and they since built on and built on and built on but that stream is still there and it's crashing right into a corner of their foundation and so they working so hard to try to divert that water somehow and you don't want that to be a surprise to you when you build your 
foundation for your shipping container house. Know if there's any kind of underground water sources down there. Let's say there isn't. Another consideration is with the groundwater is you want to make sure that when you place your foundation and in, in your, in your shipping container in a certain location that the grading of the soil is going sloping down away from your foundation so that on a heavy rain or anything like that you won't have ponding coming up to that foundation that it'll flow away from from your foundation because you don't want the water to stick around in your foundation or else it can erode the bearing soil that's underneath that foundation and by the way if you want to also divert the water that does come down uh, from the ground su surface down to your footing you can use a, a perforated pipe and check out this other video that I have and I'll link it down below and it explains where that pipe goes and how to place it and how to protect it it's all in there now be sure to watch the other videos to find out the balance of all the other factors you need to be aware of because there's 13 and watch the next video so I can share with you on the next one